Good evening, everyone, and you are welcome to the third session of peptic ulcer disease. We will be talking on the management of peptic ulcer disease, the treatment, both the medical and the surgical treatment for peptic ulcer disease. As we mentioned earlier, this is a very important aspect of the lecture because peptic ulcer disease is common and is expected for every physician should be able to manage peptic ulcer disease when they present as an emergency what to do uh, to give an immediate relief and how to follow up the subsequent management of the patient. So today we'll talk on the medical treatment as well as the surgical treatment for peptic ulcer disease. Now, we should all know that the initial treatment for peptic ulcer disease is medical treatment. And of course, because of the success that is attained from medical treatment, surgery is rarely done for any patient with peptic ulcer disease because of the efficacy of the drug in acid suppression as well as elimination of helicobacter pylori infection. Surgery are rarely done except for cases of complication, which we will see shortly. Now, the general principles for treating peptic ulcer disease is one, to reduce the acid suppression by using proton pump inhibitors or H2 receptor blockers. Two, to create protective covering of the mucosa, okay, to pro protect the mucosal surface to prevent peptic damage by acid and pepsin. To eliminate H. pylori infection. Discourage lifestyle behavior like alcohol and cigarette smoking that promote ulceration. Avoid the usage of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or mitigate their effects with PPI if they must be used. You should know that behind every treatment, the principles for such treatment will make you achieve a successful outcome in the management. If, for example, there is a risk factor present and it is not eliminated and you kept on treating that patient, the symptoms will persist. You won't be able to treat the patient. For example, he has a lifestyle that is a precipitant for hyperacidity and ulceration. He consumes a lot of alcohol and you kept on treating the ulcer without eliminating such, you know your treatment won't be successful. Or it's a patient that abuses NSAIDs and you kept on treating, of course, your treatment will not be successful. So in the history, you have to carefully look out for such precipitants so that you achieve a successful outcome within the expected duration you are supposed to uh, treat the patient. The PPIs are for acid suppressions, while the other two are antibiotics, which are used for the elimination of Helicobacter pylori. Now, the proton pump inhibitor, omeprazole, pantoprazole, are given in 7 to 14 days. Okay, they are given BD for 7 to 14 days. Then the antibiotics combination, there are various types of antibiotic you may combine in this regimen. You could use amoxicillin, one gram BD for seven to 14 days, and claritromycin, 500 milligrams BD for seven to 14 days. You could combine a proton pump inhibitor with metronidazole or claritromycin. Or you could even use a levofloxacin-based triple therapy where the metronidazole is replaced with levofloxacin. Now, for the quadruple therapy, in addition, 
you could call this the second line treatment in case after the first line treatment using the triple therapy, you completed the treatment and yet there's persistence of symptoms. You might want to change to a quadruple therapy where you add a bismuth subsalicylate. You remember we mentioned among the principle is to protect the mucosal surface from excessive peptic action. Now you use bismuth to protect uh, the mucosal surface. And this treatment, these combinations are given for up to 14 days. The proton pump inhibitors is continued for 10 days in the sequential treatment. Then amoxicillin, one gram is given for the first five days along with the PPI. This is then followed with clarithromycin and metronidazole, 500 milligrams each BD for the next five days. So throughout the sequential therapy, patient will be on proton pump inhibitor, while the antibiotics are actually splitted in the first five days, then the next five days. Or you could give the levofloxazine based combination where the first 10 days, of course, the, throughout the sequential therapy, you place patients on proton pump inhibitor followed by amoxicillin, one gram BD4, the first five days, followed by levofloxacin and metronidazole for the next five days. Now, you should note that in the medical treatment, any patient that presents as an emergency or a hospitalized patient who presented with a complicated PUD should receive a high dose of intravenous proton pump inhibitor. Now, when you are at the emergency and a patient presents with exacerbated features of peptic ulcer disease, acute exacerbation of peptic ulcer disease, you won't prescribe the oral medications. You will commence your treatment with a parenteral proton pump inhibitor. When patient is discharged, then you now place the patient on oral treatment. And you should also note that if H. pylori testing is treat, uh, tested negative at, um, and the symptoms persist, empirical trial of anti-H. pylori therapy is reasonable since false negative H. pylori test is not uncommon. Now, you might, patient might have dyspeptic symptoms and he presents after testing for H. pylori and it turns out to be negative. You still have to try the empirical treatment for H. pylori because of the high rate of false negative test in, in the H. pylori. And even after the treatment, testing for H. pylori should be repeated four weeks after cessation of the treatment, okay? because immediately after the treatment, you might still be testing a positive H. pylori. So you have to delay for up to about four weeks, then you now test for H. pylori, which will confirm if there is elimination of this um, important causative bacteria or not. Now, it is very important, you know the drugs uh, using acid suppression and there are various rules as well as the preferred drugs you use because without knowing this you might be wrongly treating the patient with uh, the wrong acid suppression and patient might not do well. You should know um, most times when patients have dyspeptic symptoms they are given drugs like antacids H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors. So you need to be conversant with 
the principles of this medication, how they act actually. Now you should see, just looking at this table, you realize that the um, antacid is just something you give for an immediate relief when a patient has a dyspeptic symptom. The onset of action is less than 10 minutes, okay? And its duration of action is 30 to 60 minutes. So it's something that you use to give a temporary relief for a patient who presented with dyspeptic symptoms. Now, the site of action is in the stomach lumen and the end result is to neutralize stomach acid. The mechanism of action is neutralization of the gastric acid and its efficacy is lowest among the drugs we use. And these are the common side effects. An example is magnesium triacylate. The, uh, the H2 blockers, the onset of action is a little bit, okay, faster than PPI. It's less than one hour. And you can see the duration is longer than antacids. It's the, the duration of action lasts up to 12 hours. And the site of their action is inside the parietal cells. And the end result is suppression of gastric acid secretion. And the mechanism of action is they block the H2 receptors. That is the histamine receptors. We've discussed the pathophysiology of this in the previous lectures. And its efficacy, you can see, is more than that of the antacids, but less than the proton pump inhibitors. And these are the common side effects they may have. An example is ranitidine. Proton pump inhibitors, you can see they have a longer onset of action, but the duration of action, you can see it's longer. So the, the onset of action might be up to two days, two to three days. But when it starts acting, it acts for a very uh, a longer duration compared to other classes of drugs. You can see the duration of action is one to two days and the size of action is, okay, at the parietal cells. Inside the parietal cells, it suppresses gastric acid secretion and the mechanism of action is they block the proton pump system. Now, it has the greatest efficacy among the drugs used for acid uh, suppression. These are some, some of its side effects. Example is omeprazole, pantoprazole, and many others. Now, what are the advantages of the proton pump inhibitors over the H2 receptor blockers? You should know that proton pump inhibitor yield a greater acid suppression than H2 blockers. Why is that so? This is due to the fact that other stimuli, in addition to H2 stimulation, uh, H2 receptor, stimulate acid production in the stomach. Okay, there are some other stimuli aside the H2, aside histamine and the histamine blocks only the H2 receptors. And the PPI will block other stimuli. So that's why it is more potent in suppressing the acid secretion. Now, after you've done a treatment, a medical treatment, okay, um, for maximum of, um, you completed the first two weeks, followed by a sequential therapy and patients still present with symptoms, okay? If you repeat the treatment for the second time and patients still persist, that is a failed medical treatment, okay? That is a failed medical treatment or after you've completed the first line treatment, the sequential treatment and patient failed, you now repeated maybe the second line and patient failed 
So you will have termed that treatment a failed medical treatment. Now, the surgical treatment for peptic ulcer disease what are the indications for surgery when there is a refractory ulcer to a massive bleeding not responding to endoscopic treatment? Because the first um, line treatment for upper GI bleeding from peptic ulcer disease is endoscopic um, treatment. However, if this failed endoscopic treatment because of massive bleeding, you cannot visualize the site of the bleeding. Endoscopy might fail, or even after you arrest the bleeding endoscopically and within 24 hours, there's another massive bleeding. You can term that as a massive bleeding that is not responding to endoscopic treatment. When there is perforation, when the ulcer perforates, they will present with generalized peritonitis. And of course, you need to do an exploratory laparotomy and um, repair the site of perforation. Okay, suction and lavage the peritoneal cavity. When there's a gastric outlet obstruction, you also do surgery. Now, the aim of your surgery for peptic ulcer disease is to reduce gastric acid output permanently because a duodenal ulcer heals if the gastric acid secretion is diminished. And you, you also aim to reduce the rate of recurrence because if a patient is treated with medical therapy and the ulcer becomes refractory or even recurrent, you want to do surgery. Now, what are the various types of surgery that are done for peptic ulcer disease? Now, vagotomy, there are various types of vagotomy. Truncal vagotomy. Vagotomy is the navigation of the vagus nerve, both the anterior and the posterior vagus, that is vagotomy. You denervate it by excising a piece of that nerve, okay, that so that you denervate the supply, the separatomotor supply of the stomach. Now there are various types, the truncal vagotomy with drainage procedure, selective vagotomy, which is no longer done is just to um, mention to be discarded due to its high um, morbidity and even recurrence, recurrence rates. Highly selective vagotomy or parietal cell vagotomy. This is the preferred form of vagotomy or a posterior truncal vagotomy plus an anterior seromyotomy, which is also known as the Taylor's operation. Vagotomy can be combined with antrectomy, where the distal half or the antrum of the stomach is removed after vagotomy. You now do an antrectomy with a gastrojejunostomy, gastrojejunostomy. You could do a partial gastrectomy, which could be in form of BROT1 or BROT2, which we will see shortly. Then Graham's patch is done for a perforated peptic ulcer disease. Bleeding peptic ulcer, one may underrun the bleeding ulcer with suture, or when it is coming from the gastroduodenal artery, there is ligation of the gastroduodenal artery. So we are going to see this individually. Vagotomy. Vagotomy removes the cephalic 
stimulation of the ozentic cells. Acid secretion is reduced by 60%. The types of vagotomy. Truncal vagotomy and a drainage procedure. The two nerves, okay, the two vagi, trunks are divided below the diaphragm near the hiatus. Nerve twig are sought and divided. If you remember in the previous lecture, we talked about the criminal nerve of Grassi that leaves the vagus nerve above the diaphragm before it enters the esophageal hiatus. So if you are concentrating on only the vagus nerve as they come in through the esophageal hiatus and you miss the twig, it's a cause of recurrent peptic ulcer disease. So you have to sort and divide the twigs. As the gastric tone and motility diminishes and the emptying of the stomach is delayed, you, you see there is going to be stasis because you've removed the, um, the nerve supply that gives the contractility. So there is going to be stasis of the stomach content. So you need to do a drainage procedure in form of pyloroplasty or gastrojejunostomy. You can't do a truncal vagotomy without doing a drainage procedure. Mark you, you can't do a truncal vagotomy without doing a drainage procedure because there's going to be stasis of the content due to lack of contractility. So we are going to see the various types of the drainage procedure will do. Now look at the truncal vagotomy uh, we talked about. Now if you have the vagus nerve, in truncal vagotomy you don't just transect the nerve. What you do, you actually take a segment of the nerve, like 2 cm of the segment. Then this segment is, you send it for histology. for confirmation that it's actually the vagus nerve you are excising. So this um, image shows uh, truncal vagotomy, where the anterior and the posterior vagus are resected. A segment is resected. Now, what are the various types of pyloroplasty, which is a drainage procedure because as we mentioned, after the vagotomy, there is going to be stasis of the content of the stomach. Now, pyloroplasty, a longitudinal incision about six centimeters is made along the pylorus at the mid anterior part and sutured transversely, okay? If you have a longitudinal incision is made and you suture it like this transversely, okay? It means you are going to widen the pyloric sphincter. Let's um, see what we are talking about. Now, the, this is the antrum, the pylorus, and the duodenum. This is a six centimeter incision that is made on the pylorus longitudinally. Then you can see at B, the incision is closed transversely. Now, when you do that, you are widening the pylorus such that the content will drain into the duodenum. And when you make this incision, you completely destroy the sphincteric action of the pylorus. The pyloric sphincter is destroyed and widened. So this widens and destroyed pyloric sphincter 
and allows free drainage from the stomach to the duodenum. There are various types, the hernicumiculis pyloroplasty, which is the commonly, most commonly done, the thinny pyloroplasty and the javule pyloroplasty. What we just described here is the hernicumiculis pyloroplasty, which is the most commonly performed um, drainage procedure where you have um, the commonly performed pyloroplasty, where you make a longitudinal incision, six centimeters, and you close it transversely to widen the pylorus. Now, what are the other types of pyloroplasty? The thinny pyloroplasty. In the thinny pyloroplasty, you can see the incision, there is an inverted incision that is made at the lower end of the stomach and duodenum. Then this is now connected, okay, by suturing the posterior layer separately and then the anterior layer by a suturing technique that is called Cornell through and through suture. This is a form of gastroduodenostomy. It's another form of pyloroplasty for drainage. And if you notice where the incision is made is on the under surface of the stomach with the adjacent duodenum just like an inverted U incision is made. However, this is more cumbersome. So it is not commonly done as compared to the hernicumiculis. Now, the javule pyloroplasty is done in situations where you notice a scarring at the gastroduodenal junction. So you actually do... Um, two incisions. You can see one here on the stomach and the other one at the duodenum. You connect these two incisions by passing that area of scar on the pylorus. So this is a form of drainage procedure after you've done a truncal vagotomy. The next form of Drainage procedure is gastrojejunostomy. Here, the jejunum about here the jejunum about fifteen centimeters from the duodenal jejunal junction is anastomosed, usually to the posterior wall of the stomach. That is the most dependent position of the stomach you do an anastomosis, okay? So, now this is done retrocolic behind the transverse colon for physiologic drainage. Um, if you have more questions, I'll clarify that so that you understand more. It's a good choice for severely diseased duodenum or in gastric outlet obstruction. Now, look at if there is a severely diseased duodenum here, for example, you will just bypass the duodenum and go straight ahead to the jejunum and do a gastro -jejunostomy. So, most of the time, we prefer to do a gastro -jejunostomy compared to pyloroplasty. So you just go to the dependent part of the stomach, the posterior wall of the stomach, and get a loop of jejunum, bring it through the mesentery of the transverse colon. So it's going to be retrocolic, so that there is going to be physiologic, it's the drainage is going to be more uh, in the more dependent position. Now you should know that when you do a gastro 
there is a risk of marginal ulceration at the jejunum. If you remember, we mentioned the common site of peptic ulceration. We said in the jejunum at the site of gastrojejunostomy, if you remember. Okay. So, this is the gastrojejunostomy. You can see the stomach is anastomosed with the jejunum. Now, these anastomoses, you, you bring the anastomosis through a defect in the mesocolon, okay? It should be a retrocolic anastomosis. Now, we've talked about the first type of vagotomy, which is vagotomy plus a drainage procedure. And this drainage could either be pyloroplasty or gastrogenostomy. Now, another type of vagotomy is the selective vagotomy. I told you that this is no longer done. It's just to be mentioned, to be discarded. But, of course, you need to know what it means. Vagotomy with sparing of the hepatic branch of the anterior vagus and the celiac branch of the posterior vagus. This will not reduce secretions. And of course, the drainage procedure is performed because of stasis. It is time consuming and it's associated with more morbidity and mortality. So it has been abandoned. And the recurrence rate is about 10%. Now, the highly selective vagotomy is the preferred type of vagotomy. The highly selective vagotomy is also called the parietal cell vagotomy. What does it do? It aims at denervating only the acid producing ozentic gland, sparing nerve to the pyloric antrum, which is called the nerve of latagex, such that drainage procedure is not required. So here, the innervation to the antrum is maintained, okay? The nerve of lethargy. So contractility will continue. So you don't need a drainage procedure. You just denervate the parietal cells. However, the stomach contractility continues to push food into the duodenum. Now, it is difficult to determine the exact area of denervation of osetic cells. So it also have a recurrent rate of about 10%. However, it is preferred because you don't have to do a drainage procedure and the um, procedure is shorter. Now you can see after you have isolate the vagus nerve, okay? You can see like 6 to 8 cm from the diaphragmatic opening. You can see the abdominal esophagus. You isolate the vagus. Then you now denervate all. This is the vagus. Okay. The last part is called the nerve of latagex that is supplying the antrum. But all these branches that are supplying the body are divided, they are incised, so that the parietal cells are denervated, they don't secrete acid. However, the contraction of the antrum is maintained, and hence you don't need a drainage procedure. So this is highly selective um, vagotomy. Then the tylos operation, this is seromyotomy, okay? You denervate the fundic parietal mass. You preserve the nerve of lethargic. Just what we showed here. Okay. Then what do you do? 
Okay, you now do a posterior truncal vagotomy. The posterior vagus is completely denervated. The anterior one, you just do uh, what you do in the uh, highly selective vagotomy. Now, but the seromyotomy here, you can see for this highly selective vagotomy, it is the nerves you look for and denervate. But in this one, it is the muzzle, okay? 1.5 centimeters from the lesser curvature, you make an incision to do a seromyotomy. The serosa and the muscles uh, are incised to denervate the supply. So those are the types of vigotomy and the uh, ones that are commonly used. Now, vigotomy usually can be combined with antrectomy. However, this procedure is not commonly done. Why? Because it's associated with more complications and it takes a longer duration. After vigotomy, the distal half of the stomach is resected and the gastric remnant is anastomosed with the duodenum. Anytime you do a partial gastrectomy and you anastomose it with the duodenum, the remnant of the stomach with the duodenum, gastroduodenostomy is brought one. When you do a partial gastrectomy and the remnant, you anastomose it with the jejunum, it is brought two. We shall see that shortly. So vagotomy plus antrectomy is another form of treatment you do for peptic ulcer disease. However, you should know that vagotomy and antrectomy is associated, it, ha it has a low ulcer recurrence rate and is applicable for most of the complicated ulcers like bleeding, okay, intractability and so on. However, it has a high operative mortality because you are combining vagotomy. Okay, after doing the procedure of vagotomy, as we described, you now do a distal antrum. You have to remove the antrum. Then you now, the third surgery again, you now do an anastomosis. You see, it has a longer duration associated with higher morbidity and mortality, even though there is lesser recurrence rate, but it's not worth it if you have a better uh, procedures with better, that will give you a good outcome. Now, we've talked about vagotomy and drainage procedures. We've talked about vagotomy and antrectomy. Now, partial gastrectomy, okay? Now, for this, if you remember, in antrectomy, we said you remove the distal half of the stomach or the antrum of the stomach. In partial gastrectomy, you are removing up to two thirds, okay? You are removing two thirds to three fourth, three quarter of the distal stomach. Then you now resect the remnant with either the duodenum or the jejunum. So when you do partial gastrectomy with end to end gastro duodenostomy, that is called Birot 1. It is done for gastric ulcer. Let me demonstrate that for you with an image so that you understand clearly. Okay. If this is the stomach, and the duodenum. Okay, now you just remove two third of this. You remove this. This is the remnant and this is the duodenum. Then you now do
you do a gastro duodenostomy. This is called the root one. So it's partial gastrectomy with gastro duodenostomy. This is what Birot one, and it's preferred when you have ulcer here in the antrum. That is, if gastric ulcer in the antrum, difficult to treat, that is intractable, you can do, or bleeding, you can do this um, procedure. Then Birot two, we said Birot two is partial gastrectomy with end to side gastro jejunostomy with a blind ended duodenum done for proximal gastric ulcers now look at let's demonstrate what this procedure look like now for this is the stomach duodenum okay so when you take out, let's say two third, because this end, there will be a blinded end. You have remnant of the stomach. Okay. You will bring a loop of J genome and anastomose. Don't forget the duodenum is still there. You have a blind end of the duodenum. This is called Birot 2. So you do a partial gastrectomy with a gastro jejunostomy. You have a blind ended loop of duodenum. So this is Birot 2 procedure. It is done, okay, also for peptic ulcer disease. Now, Graham's patch, okay? This is a procedure that is done for a perforated peptic ulcer disease. This perforation is commonly at the, at the antrum of the stomach, or they could be at the first part of the duodenum. So what you do for Graham's patch, if there is a perforation here, okay, in the anterior first part of the duodenum. What you do, you bring a loop, you put some sutures through and through, okay, this perforation. You bring some sutures through and through the perforation, you now bring a tongue of omentum. You place the omentum, okay? You remember the omentum, the policeman of the abdomen. You bring it and lay it over the perforation. Then you now tie the sutures over that perforation. So a piece of omentum is used to cover the perforation. Three or four interrupted sutures are inserted through and through along the long axis. So you now tie the omentum over the perforation. You should also know the modified Graham's patch. In the modified Graham's patch, before you um, place the omentum, you first of all cover the perforation before tie in the piece of um, momentum over that site of perforation. Now in bleeding peptic ulcer disease, when a patient presents with massive bleeding with failed endoscopic arrest of bleeding, you do a suture ligation of the gastroduodenal artery. If you remember, we discussed the blood supply of the stomach. And uh, we mentioned that the first part of the duodenum, the anterior parts perforate while the posterior parts bleed. 
and posterior to the first part of the duodenum, you have the gastroduodenal artery at that side. So when there is an ulcer eroding in the posterior part of the first part of the duodenum and it erodes into the gastroduodenal artery, you will have massive bleeding. So you have to do a pyloro uh, duodenotomy. You have to open the pylorus and the duodenum. You now apply sutures above and below the ulcer. You like this. Okay. The pyloro You make an incision here. You open the anterior part of the pylorus and the first part of the duodenum. Non-absorbable sutures must be incorporated. There. You must incorporate the artery proximally and distally. Okay. So when you do that, you now um, stop the bleeding. And usually, this patient, when they erode, when there's erosion into the gastrointestinal artery, you should know that they commonly present with massive bleeding. Sometimes this bleeding might just come from an ulcer. There's no specific artery. The bleeding is just pouring out from that ulcer. So what you do, you just run a suture. Okay? That is what you call under running the ulcer with a suture. Okay? It stops the bleeding. So those are the various forms of surgery you do for a complicated peptic ulcer disease. If you, uh, if we are to recap, we said you do a vagotomy. Okay, you do a truncal vagotomy with a drainage procedure. And these drainages could either be pyloroplasty or gastrogegenostomy. You do a highly selective highly selective vagotomy, which is the parietal cell vagotomy. You denervate innervation of the ozintic cell of the um, body, preserving the nerve of latergate. The selective vagotomy is no longer done. Then the Taylor's procedure which is posterior truncal vagotomy and anterior seromyotomy, the Taylor's procedure, okay? So these are the various forms of vagotomy. We mentioned this vagotomy could be combined with antrectomy. We could also do a partial gastrectomy in form of either BROT1 or BROT2. Then we now mention the Graham's patch that is done for a perforated peptic ulcer disease. You could do the modified Graham's patch or just the Graham's patch. Then for a bleeding peptic ulcer, you could do a suture ligation of the gastroduodenal artery, or you could underrun the ulcer base with a suture. Now, these surgical options in the treatment of duodenal or uh, gastric ulcer, this table just summarizes some various indications and some preferred procedures you um, can do. Uh, for the various indications. We mentioned the indications could be bleeding, perforation, um, obstruction in form of GOO, then intractability or non-healing. And you can see this is in decreasing order of frequency. This is in decreasing order of frequency in terms of their occurrence. Now, we'll talk about the complications of surgical treatment of peptic ulcer 
disease. Now, patients could have bleeding, okay? They could be primary hemorrhage, okay? From the site of your anastomosis. When you do gastrojejunostomy, they could bleed primarily from your site of the anastomosis. The gotomy patients will present with gastric retention, okay, because you have denervated the stomach and contractility is lost. So there will be retention, patient will have dyspepsia, pain and feeling of fullness in the epigastric region and vomiting. And this can be managed by passage of NG2. The pain can also, they could have dysphagia. Then duodenal blowout, there could be leakage from the duodenal stump. If you remember BROF2, we said there's a blind-ended duodenal stump. Now that stump, um, the pressure within that apparent loop will increase and the intraluminal pressure could exceed the uh, pressure around your suture site at the duodenal stump and they may present with a duodenal blowout. Now, obstruction of the stoma. After doing an anastomosis, patient might have edema around the site of the anastomosis, which will present with a form of obstruction. And of course, you know, this will require passage of NG tube and clearing, drainage to relieve the inflammation and the edema, okay? They may present also with acute pancreatitis. The late complications um, will include the dumping syndrome, and there are two types of dumping syndrome, the early dumping syndrome and the late dumping syndrome. This is something you need to go and read about because um, early dumping syndrome um, results when in the first 20 to 30 minutes after patients uh, has vagotomy, okay, uh, the, the or pyloroplasty or a gastrojejunostomy, the hyperosmolar can moves into the jejunum. That hyperosmolarity will now um, a kind of uh, pull fluid into the lumen of the duodenum or the jejunum, and patient will present with um, hypovolemia, sweating, tachycardia, fainting, and all other features of um, hypoglycemia. So this occur within the first 20 minutes of um, feeding after um, gastrojejunostomy. If you do that, uh, the hyperosmolarity will pull in water and patient will present with uh, features of hypovolemia. Okay, he will be sweating, fainting, palpitations, okay. Sometimes they may have diarrhea. So usually when you do the go to me for patients, you don't, you give them small uh, frequent meals that are rich in protein and fat, okay? Low in carbohydrate because if you give them high carbohydrate, they will have hyperosmolarity and they take little or no water with meal. Now in the late dumping syndrome, this usually occur like two to four hours after meal. It's a form of reactive hypoglycemia, reactive hypoglycemia that occurs like two to four hours after patient takes in meal and is um, profound hypoglycemia following release of insulin large amount of insulin and patient goes into <clears throat> hypoglycemia and patient will have symptoms of dizziness, warm sweating, trembling 
And of course, when you do these procedures for patients, you should have um, the sugar by the bedside such that when patient goes into hypoglycemia, they can quickly take something with glucose to regain um, themselves. And of course, to prevent this, patient is giving frequent small meals with low carbohydrate and more fat. Diarrhea, steatoria, reflux. Now, patients with vagotomy, usually they have um, diarrhea or patients with pyloroplasty because you are reducing the sphincter mechanism of the pylorus. So the transit time will now increase. Sorry, the transit time will reduce because you have re removed the sphincter. So they will have diarrhea. Steatoria, fat absorption reduces uh, enterogastric reflux because of the stasis after the gotomy. Recurrent ulceration, usually the ulcer is at the site of the anastomosis. Iron deficiency, anemia, when you do an antrectomy and you bypass the duodenum, you do a gastrojejunostomy because iron is absorbed in the duodenum. And of course, acid secretion is required for absorption of this iron. You transected the antrum that produced majority of the acid and you bypass the duodenum. They could develop an iron deficiency anemia. Okay. Risk of colorectal tumor because the bile secretion increases, secondary bile acid increases. We've discussed this risk factor in the lecture on colorectal cancer. Megaloblastic anemia can also be seen. You have osteomalacia, anastomotic ulcers, as we mentioned, uh, gastrojejunal fistula, all these are less complications. So, uh, the prognosis, you know, the overall operative procedure gives satisfactory results in at least 80% of patient mortality of the gotomy and drainage is less than 1%. Okay. Partial gastrectomy has an overall mortality of 2%. 90% are satisfied with results. 2% anastomotic ulceration and 5 to 10 percent dumping problem and duodenal mortality uh, operative mortality for perforation of duodenal uh, ulcer is up to seven percent so we are going to stop here and um, if you have any questions you can um, ask in conclusion, peptic ulcer requires surgeries. Requiring surgeries are complicated and the patient presents as an emergency which requires adequate resuscitation. Delay in presentation, diagnosis and treatment increases morbidity and mortality. So um, if you have any questions, clarifications, uh, you can unmute yourself so that we discuss. Okay. <laughs> Any question? Okay, it appears we don't have any question. If there is no question, okay, if there is no any question, we are going to stop here. We have completed all our lectures on peptic ulcer disease. Next. Um, if we are to discuss pathology, we are going to talk on gastric CA. But now for peptic ulcer disease, we've discussed all the aspects. So thank you all. We are going to stop here.